Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Human Law Comparison presentation, Jesus briefly compares God's laws with human law in some fundamental areas to set the foundation for two further discussions about flaws in our individual and collective attitudes, feelings, and emotions towards God's laws. Recorded on the 6th of November 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, um, this discussion is a one hour long discussion and there is no Q&A for it. So, so what we need to do is have a bit of an interaction together with it. And so feel free to put up your hands whenever you want through the discussion. And there's also four questions I notice that people have written down regarding this discussion and we'll try to get to those questions because they are quite good questions as we go through the discussion as well. So here we're talking about human law comparison. What we're doing here is we're talking about comparing God's laws with human laws and seeing what the results are. That's our purpose of this discussion. So what's the reasons for doing this? Well, firstly, my personal pain is that since I've, from my childhood onwards, I've been exposed to parental law or caregiver law, I suppose you could call it. And, and then, of course, as I've grown into an adult, I'm now exposed to societal law. And the problem is both caregiver law or parent law and societal law have their issues, have a lot of problems. Most parents are very inconsistent with the way in which they apply law to their children. And then when the child grows up to be an adult, the, the parent doesn't have to bear the consequence of their inconsistency. Society does. And so then society created a whole heap of laws to actually circumnavigate the fact that parents didn't do their job right and it created a whole heap of children who are now adults who about to break the law. <laughs> and so, so we end up with this problem where we have a pain inside of us. It's a pain in the sense that it causes our pain and suffering as well. But this pain is created by, since this childhood, I've been exposed to parents who uh, have no idea or clueless about law. And then as a result, when the parents get rid of the child, the child is now foisted onto society and now society has to create, create a whole of your laws to deal with the unruly children that are now adults. And this is a part of my pain that exists with inside of me. So I've developed, as a result of that, attitudes towards law, whether it's God's law or human's law, there's attitudes now inside of me that are out of harmony with love, that come from my childhood experience, but that are imposed upon human and God's laws. Right? And this is why the majority of you, when we talk about law or we raise the issue of law, your first, uh, usually your first inclination is to rebel. Right? And it's because of these pro pro problems that come from childhood. Now, I have attitudes to God's law which cause me much heartache and pain. So what happens is I think that God's laws should be much the same as what parents and society's laws were in that I could ignore most of them and uh, disobey a lot of them and get away with it. And so then I try doing that with God's laws. Right? And it doesn't work. And instead I get a lot of pain and suffering as a result of that. Right? And so this is a source of the majority of our pain and suffering is the fact that we choose to disobey God's laws and we have been predisposed to do so because of the parental and societal inconsistencies that are now in, inside of me as belief systems that exist. So this is a big issue for us. We need to make a comparison to start highlighting some of the areas where society and parental law is very very different to God's laws so that we can examine and later compare and make the comparison to see what kind of hangover we have from our parental our childhood upbringing and also from our living in the society the way it's currently configured and this if we are honest in this examination we have we, we will have exposed to us many of our unhealed, unloving emotions that we will need to work our way through in order to correct the problem. 
And this is why an honest examination and particularly an honest self-examination of this particular subject is very important. So what we first do is we want to compare these things and, and then also throughout the comparison what I'd like to do is ha ha have with you some honest self-examination of these particular issues so that uh, we can identify where the problems lay and we can start then to address what kind of emotions may be driving our underlying problems. Yep. So I need to examine the attitude to God's laws if I want to become happy. This is a primary thing we need to remember. If, I, if my attitude remains the same as it currently is towards God's laws, then it's highly likely that I'm going to continue sinning. And this is what I've noticed for many of you last who have known me for years and years now. You continue sinning in the same way because you think it doesn't matter. And hopefully you're getting already from our discussion about law that from God's perspective, it matters. Right? And therefore, much of our pain and suffering comes from our attitude that it doesn't matter. And that needs to be addressed. Okay, some other reasons. If I compare God's laws with human law, I have a chance to identify the injuries. So, so this is why it's wise to go through this discussion with you. And there will be a series of three things that we're going to analyse here in this discussion, and this is the first one of them. So the first thing is comparing the human law with God's laws. The second thing is examining our attitudes inside of us emotionally. And we'll be doing that on day, I think it's day four, we'll examine the attitudes. And also on day four, we'll look at what the subsequent result of that analysis means in terms of how we're hung over and how we impose these hangover beliefs upon God's laws. So we basically, this is the first part of a three-part discussion about this subject. Does that make sense? So... God's law, these emotional injuries prevent me from obeying God's laws. They prevent me from being happy and they prevent, or, or sorry, cause pain for myself and others, which, is, which are all big problems, right? Those three things are big problems. And we need, to, we need to have this discussion so that we can begin the process of correcting this problem. Yep. Now, remember, this, this whole series is all about getting an education in love. Now, if you're going to become loving, you're going to have to become what God defines as loving. Now, what God defines as loving, as we've already established in this discussion over the last two days, is that God's personality and nature, and therefore what God defines as loving, is imposed upon God's principles. So all the principles we're discussing, and there are many more, remember, but all the principles we are discussing have a facet of love in them and a facet of truth in them. And so anywhere where we are disharmonious with these principles automatically means that we're not just sinning against one law. We're sinning against probably close to every law as soon as we are disharmonious with one of these principles. Does that make sense? And we need to start seeing that this is the case. Now, why do we need to do that? Well, our next discussion is all about sin. For you to know how you are sinning, you've got to know where the law is. For you to know where the law is, you need to know the principle that governs the law. So this is why we're having this discussion of the principles governing the laws so that we can ident identify the sin and therefore correct it. Now remember, sin is our creation. And the reason why we create it is because of this problem. We have some law-based issues that we need to address. And if we don't address them, it is highly unlikely we were go are going to be able to establish or maintain a relationship with God and therefore establish or maintain any education regarding what love is and how God intended the universe to be. So you can see the importance of the discussion, right? Yeah. So let's get started. Let's look at the individual laws in terms of the flavour of the law from God's perspective 
and what the human laws define, right? And we'll compare the two. So if we examine the first one, the lawmaker is also the law enforcer and fully enforces obedience to every law. So what we're saying here is God is the lawmaker. God is also the law enforcer, right? But, it, but he doesn't do it with a little tally, does he? He does it because every law is self-enforcing, right? So, but he's still a law enforcer. And each law enforces obedience to, to the law. It, you're enforced to obey. When I say you're forced to obey, I'm not saying that you can't choose to disobey. I'm just saying that there is going to be a penalty associated with disobedience. And the parent's penalty is guaranteed. It's not negotiable. It's guaranteed. Now, human lawmakers are not the, usually the law enforcers. So in other words, the lawmakers, what are they? They are judges and politicians. Well, it's, the lawmaker is really the politicians or the dictators, you know, the people who are ruling are the lawmakers, and the judges are a part of the enforcement system. So the judges and the politicians are the enforcement systems, and that's so they are the laws. Uh, sorry, the judges and the policemen are the law enforcers. However, if we take it even further than that, the lawmakers began in your childhood, so your parents were actually a part of this lawmaking system. Right? And in fact, they were the primary part of the lawmaking system. Before you even knew there was such a thing as a policeman or a judge, you had a parent. And they established the law with you, whatever laws they wanted, unfortunately. Now, so the lawmaker could also be said to be the parent or the caregiver. And the parent or the caregiver is also a law enforcer when you're in your childhood. So they become your law enforcers. And the problem is, parents, caregivers, judges, politicians, policemen cannot enforce obedience to every law that they create. They can't. And so what does that do to you? That causes you to believe that you can get away with some things. And as long as they don't know about it, it doesn't matter. You'll get away with it. Isn't that what they... What, what it causes you to believe. But from God's perspective, you're not going to get away with it. So this is already creating a problem for us. We believe we'll get away with whenever we break law, but from God's perspective, God's saying, no, no, you're never going to get away with it. Ever. Because right? God's laws, as we've seen in our previous discussion on permanence, God's laws measure every thought you have every feeling you have and the tally just keeps getting based upon those thoughts and feelings as well as your actions it even measures every intention every desire because every one of those things god created as measurable so that the law could work upon them and god's wanting to change those motivations we have so that they are pure Right, so is there any questions about that one that you'd like to ask? If we go to Jada up the back, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, is there, a, sorry, uh, is there a point of having human laws? If God's laws are all already automatically doing all these things. The problem is, Jada, is humans don't, don't actually honour God's laws. So, of course, any society that involves people that don't honour God's laws are going to have to create additional laws. Does that make sense? Because the people who don't honour God's laws are, 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 will be anarchists otherwise. Mm. Right? So, so, in the end, yes, we are going to have to, at some point, in particularly during this transitional phase, we're going to have to create law in order to have a... To have a, a society that has some cohesion but in the long run if all of us made the choice to obey God's laws life on earth would be much better and we would have no human law that that is possible but it's not a possibility while some choose to disobey God's laws and choose to harm others as a result of that disobedience mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah 
Yeah. In the spirit world, th that is reality. There are no laws. There's no human laws. And when I say there's no human laws, um, it depends on where you are in the spirit world as to whether there's no human laws. So, so up until the sixth sphere, so the first five spheres, there are human laws still. Does that make sense? And any society that has wants some cohesion creates their own law. Right? But in the celestial heavens, there is no human laws at all. Not, not a single one. Everything is run through God's laws. In fact, you can't even get to the celestial heavens unless you obey God's laws. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. So we need to start seeing on earth too that, that society would be much better if we all chose to discover and obey God's laws. We need to see that. But that's going to take some time, isn't it? And perhaps may never happen. Depends on the will of individuals, doesn't it? Yeah. That's a good question. Mm. All right. One thing I would like to say here about the lawmakers with, with childhood, I think, uh, Yvonne, maybe we can answer your question. Where are you? Is this over here? We can answer your question about this because it's about parents. Mm. Um, so y you've asked? Um. Can, can I disassociate my parents from God so that I'm not automatically putting my hangover onto God? Yeah, it's going to be very hard, to be honest, because even if you disassociate you know, emotionally from your parents with regard to law, the reality is the attitudes are already inside you now. And they are now a part of you. So, so they're not a part of now, they're not just a part of your parents anymore, they're a part of you. They're in you. And, and, and it's your attitudes that are causing the problem, not your parents' attitudes, particularly for someone like yourself who has been a long time since you've been with your parents, right? So, so you know, the reality is you can disassociate with your parent, from your parents in terms of trying to disassociate the problem, but the reality is it's not going to address your problem. Your problem is that you're carrying around these issues inside of you now and they have to be addressed by you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to be frank with you, Joy, you're very reluctant to address them. So, <laughs> Well, I've only just started to feel them as a result of doing these exercises. Yeah, but, well, you know, we've been talking about many of these yeah. things for years. Remember, we went through a whole series of presentations about the world's definition of love versus God's definition of love, and the majority of you just skip over all of that, mm -hmm. not seeing that these attitudes are inside of yourself. And, and, unless, and remember, God's laws are working upon your attitudes. So every time you retain an attitude that's out of harmony with God's law, there's automatically a sin and therefore more penalty. Mm. You see? So you're actually causing your own problems by retaining these, these false definitions, you see? And, and this is why it's very important for us to understand that disassociation from parents in this regard is not going to cure the problem because the problem exists inside of us and the energy systems that God is measuring are not your parents' energy systems but the energy systems inside of you. Does that make sense? And God does not attribute sin of your parents to you. It's now become your sin because you now have the same ideas or concepts as your parents. You follow? So now it is part, it's a part of your sin, not a part of theirs. So you, the trouble is many of you, because you, we've been talking about emotions, many of you have believed that, that, oh, I can blame my parents for my attitudes. Right? And that, that is not on from God's perspective. You can't blame them for your attitudes anymore. You're adults. You're acting upon attitudes that are now inside of you. The only way these attitudes are going to change is by you changing them. And God's not going to force their change, although each law does correct it through the penalty. So, but God's not going to say, you have to change, Joy. But what he's going to do is say, every time you break this law, there's going to be another penalty and another penalty and another penalty until you realise that you're under so much pain and suffering that you want to change. <laughs> And that's where we need to go. We need to, we need to start seeing you know, how much pain do we have to have Mm. Before we decide to change. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So it's a good question. Okay, well, let's move on. So we go, whoops, next one, uh, back forward. Bang, 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 sorry. 
Next one, next one. The lawmaker and enforcer is infinitely and always aware, perfect and infallible. So this is God now. So God's laws, the lawmaker knows exactly what's going on every single moment. God's soul is like a huge emotional measuring system. You follow me? If I can measure 100 people in a room through my emotions being open, do you think God is limited the same way as I am? No. So God can measure every single being God has ever created and what's going on for that being. As I said in the first century, it's paradise, God knows. Hair falls out of your head, God knows. Because it's all energetic systems and God is highly sensitive. He is infinitely sensitive to any energetic change inside of your soul. He is like a finely tuned instrument measuring every minute infinitesimal infinitesimally small detail of what's going on inside of you. And God's laws, of course, measure those things as a part of that function. So, so what that means is, you think you had a thought that God didn't catch? <laughs> sorry, not the case. If you think you had a feeling that God didn't see? Sorry, not the case. All right. Do you think you took an action that just because no one was around, nobody saw it? Sorry, not the case. Uh -huh. What do we believe? The lawmaker and the force, law enforcers and police have little awareness and are able to fail and are imperfect. And so we think, well, that's not a very fair law. I'll break it. That's not a very nice thing they've made. I'm going to break it. They won't see me. I'll break it. And this causes a hangover for us you see we think we think with humans i can get away with things i can break things no one will catch up with me nothing will ever happen no one will catch up with me we even think that if we break human law that it doesn't mean we broke god's law and that's not always the case because many human laws actually have parts of god's laws incorporated in them so you've got to be even careful about which human law you start breaking. But, it, but this attitude then gets imposed upon God's laws too. So now I go around thinking, oh, God's not, God can't see me, I'll do it. But, but, you know, for many of us, we decide that there is no God and that helps. Doesn't it? Because that helps us go, oh, there's no God, so there's no God catching anything I do, right? I can just do anything with impunity. So we even come up with belief systems as a result that cause us to ignore law. Even our belief systems, we create them. So many New Age and Christian and Muslim and other religious belief systems have all been created to help avoid law. The belief system that Jesus will save you is actually a belief system primarily created to help you avoid the consequence of breaking the law. Is it not? Yeah. So therefore, it's a false belief, but its motivation was to help people avoid the consequence of law. So you'd be surprised even when you analyse religions, how much of their basic tenets have been created specifically to avoid law. Hmm. Big problem. Okay. Laws are created by the lawmaker only to benefit creation. Isn't that wonderful? Everything's based upon the fact, from God's perspective, everything's based upon me, uh, my life, my happiness, my joy, and, and not only mine, but not, I'm saying everyone is treated equally, so yours and mine. So, so that means that if I get some joy but you hurt as a result of it, well, God's not interested in that. God's laws penalise that. Does that make sense? But it has to be hurt from the way God measures it. And many of you at the moment think me telling the truth hurts you. That's not the case. Human laws. Laws created with mixed and often unpredictable benefits. And, and not only unpredictable benefits, 
the, the, the laws are created sometimes for the lawmaker even. Like, so the lawmaker goes, no, I'm sick of people doing that, so I'm going to create a law that stops them doing that. Or the lawmaker goes, I need some more money, so let's make a law that gets more money in. Right. Now, God's laws are not like that. God's laws have an altruistic benefit to everybody involved, not just to a few people. Also for all creatures as well. Like God's laws don't go, well, I'm going to make a law for you as humans, but that means that you can thoroughly destroy everything else. Right? That's not how God's laws are. God's laws are not what I would call mutually exclusive. They are inclusive. So that, what that means is that, that if it benefits me, it also has to benefit you and it also has to benefit creation and it also has to benefit every creature in creation from the highest underneath the human, which are mostly mammals, right? Right the way down to the smallest infinitesimal tiny particle has to be benefited from this law. So that, that's a bit different, isn't it, than human laws. It's like sometimes it benefits me, sometimes it benefits you, sometimes it benefits no one, sometimes it benefits the creatures, but very rarely. Sometimes it benefits just the lawmaker, sometimes it benefits just the police, sometimes it's just for the politician or the dictator. <laughs> it just depends. And as a result of that, what happens? We go... Oh, I can dismiss that one, I can dismiss this one. That one's not very fair, so I'm going to dismiss this one. And then we start getting this concept inside of us that actually I'm the arbiter, I'm the judge. I can determine which one's fair and which one's not. And so now what I observe for many of you is this is how you also see God's laws. You, you go, oh, I can ignore that one, I can ignore this one, I'm allowed to. Right? And that's how you treat it because you were taught to treat it this way from this childhood and you know, adult experience in the way we've interacted with human society. But from God's perspective, sorry, you can think you're the arbiter and judge, but you're not. You're not. If we come down to Carol. So... How do we make our way around human laws um, if we're aiming to follow all of God's laws and become aware of what they are? Is Can, I have a problem with your language already, Carol. Um, <laughs> you say make your way around human laws. See, my attitude to human law is you obey the human law unless God laws are compromised. Okay. That's my attitude. Yeah. That's always been my attitude. You obey the human law, even if it feels unfair, until God's laws are compromised in some way, then you obey God's laws. Yeah, yeah. So I was it's going quite to say, simple. for instance, conscription. Yes, so with conscription, yeah. that's the thing. What the God's law would, if I went to war, that would be breaking God's law, would it not? Yes. Depends how I went to war, perhaps. If I went to war to fix up people, I would have to consider whether those people are going back to battle or whether they're not going back to battle. If all of the people I fixed up never went back to battle, then it would be more in harmony with God's law, wouldn't it, to yeah. be a doctor or helping that. But if some of those people went back to battle, then I would have to say, well, I couldn't even do that. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So it all, it all depends on the circumstance and situation. But at the end of the day, you can see the war itself is out of harmony with God's law. So mm. therefore, if I'm conscripted, I would refuse conscription, which would mean in most countries you'd be put in jail. Yep. 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 Now, the majority of you don't want to be put in jail, so what do you do? You compromise. Mm -mm. Yeah? You don't want to be ostracised by society, so you compromise. Yep. But a person who truly honoured God's laws there wouldn't compromise. That would be it. Yep. So okay. even it meant being in jail for 10 years. I know some people, have known some people personally who were in jail for 20 years for, not being, for refusing conscription. In some countries of the world, like in Greece, and I think, I don't know if it's still in Greece, but it was in Greece, where you were conscripted once, and if you refused conscription, you were put in jail, and as soon as you got out of jail, you were conscripted again. And if you refused, you would go back in jail for another five years, 
And then as soon as you got out of jail, you'd be conscripted again. And that would happen until you were 40. So that meant that some people finished up staying in jail for 20 years in Greece for refusing conscription. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mary? Okay. I just wanted to add on that point. Um, what I notice is um, that people can say, I, this human law is dictating that I should break one of God's laws. And I'm not going to do that. But I'll break some of God's laws to avoid this human law. So, for example, in the example of conscription, if I lied to avoid conscription, if I did something damaging to myself or another person to avoid conscription, then I would be out of harmony with God's laws. Can everyone see that point? So, and I notice this a lot on earth where people say, I have a moral problem with such and such, but I'm going to break a lot of other ethics and morality to not break this so-called point of morality. Mm. So that's just a finer point to mention. Mm. We even see that with people just eating, with not eating meat. Yes. You know, you, you, you get all militant about not eating meat. And when I say militant, you try to, you know, you're unloving to other people about it. And then as a result of that, you've already broken a whole heap of other laws just because you were trying to not break one law. Right? So you, God, God, God doesn't work that way. He sees all laws as, again, ex mutually inclusive, which means that you break one to void another, then you've already sinned. Yeah. And at some point, if you break a lot in order to avoid one, one. You, your condition it must be going down, even though you think it should be going up. And even your sense of self-righteousness about it going up is another breaking of one of God's laws, and so it compounds. Because it's lack of humility, yeah. which is breaking many of God's laws. And not seeing yourself as equal to others and many other things. Yeah. yeah. Can you see? It's like you're not going to let, let off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Just not. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Um, if we go to Dave, at the back, thanks, Dave. If I have a thought out of harmony with love, but I but don't act on it, yep, is the penalty the same as if I do? And if I notice the thought and set about investigating why I have it, is the penalty the same? Um, for so let's ask the, ask the first question first, just one at a time, shall we, rather than joining your questions together. So let's just ask the first question again. If I have a thought out of harmony with love, but I don't act on it, is the penalty to my soul the same? No, it's not. And there's one reason for that, is that if you act upon it, it will have more effects on other people than if you didn't act upon it. Does that make sense? However, there will be a quite strong negative effect on your soul still, because you had the feeling to do it. So, so, so God measures everything based on the, also upon what effects it has on other people. So the reality is, if you have a thought that then turns into a feeling, that then turns into an action, then obviously that's worse than if you just had a thought that turns into a feeling, you know, that came from a feeling, and, and you identify it, and then you try to address it. Does that make sense? Yes. So, and the beauty of trying to address a feeling is that God measures also all the other feelings you have, including the raw sincerity about addressing unloving feelings. So you wanting to address an unloving feeling has a positive effect on, the law, on laws. And there's a group of laws that measure that and give you a positive kickback for that, for that desire to actually address the unloving feeling. So even just having a feeling to, undress an to address an unloving feeling is going to have some positive rewards. Do you follow me? Yes. Yes? Yeah. So everything is very, very finely attuned. You've got to remember, like I said, that God's soul and all of God's laws are sensitive measuring instruments right down to the infinitesimal feeling. Right? They are sensitive measuring instruments and measure everything. Yep. And so even an intention to positively address something, God's laws measure and they reward that feeling. 
So we've got to get away from this concept that it's all just negative. And we'll fast forward to that in a minute, and you'll see that you, you know we start. We we have so many viewpoints about law that it's all bad. It's all bad. But God's all of God's laws have rewards, you know, for for obedience. So so you know there's motivation to obey. The human laws there's no motivation to obey really is there because it's all just penalty 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 and when you obey you get nothing pretty much aside from just being left alone <laughs> yeah can i ask in regard to those rewards rewards in the, in the form of assistance or, or, or and or other things uh, a lot of things assistance uh, so there's a whole group of mechanisms that kick off where god wants to if you ask for assistance that god will ask people in the spirit world to give you some assistance or people on earth if they can tune to give you some assistance there's plenty of examples of that in the robert james lee's material if you read it and and so there's lots of different ways that god can now assist you including transmitting from god herself to you the truth about the particular thing you just broke so you know there's lots of different ways that god can assist you from personal assistance through to other beings who are more in tune with God assisting you. And all of those things uh, are engaged when you engage the law, the law of desire in that case, the principles relating to desire. So, so the reality is there's a whole heap of positive things that come out of this as well, but you know, oftentimes because of the, this problem, the comparison, we're only thinking that the law is all just negative, 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 and... You know, when we talk about it, we talk more about it, 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 you know, and we end up in a curled up ball on the ground if we're not careful because we haven't examined the positive experiences that, that can come from, from law, and particularly from God's, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So let's move on with this a bit because there's, there's aspects of this in these, in these next comments. Law is created to maintain survivability, growth and transformation of all matter and living creatures within the universe. So isn't that wonderful? God's created the laws for the specific purpose of benefiting everything. In fact, your very survival as a human in your physical form, as a human in your spiritual form and as a soul depends upon these laws. If these laws did not exist, you would not be able to even survive. So God created these laws specifically to enable your survival. Right? Uh, sorry, human laws. I'm trying to flick this screen now. <laughs> laws primarily created for the purpose of being a deterrent and enforce punishment upon the lawbreaker and to discourage the most disobedient. In fact, one thing that frustrates me a bit about human laws is that, you know, one person, one clever, who thinks he's clever, individual comes up with a way to break the law. And so what do they do? They rewrite the whole law to include that thing. And then another clever individual works a way to circumnavigate that law and get around it. So they write down that thing. It's like the very worst of people define what happens to the law. That's not how it is with God. Everybody's treated equally. Everyone's the same. Worst individual... Best individual, there's no such thing from God's perspective. But though everyone's equal and the law will be enforced no matter what. You can be almost perfect and do something wrong and, and it'd be the same thing that someone is almost, is almost completely imperfect doing some, the same thing wrong and it will be the same penalty. And you can't go, but I'm better than he was. But I do all these things right. <laughs> you can't even do that. Okay. Laws operate whether creation is aware or not. Human laws, laws operate only if the enforcer is aware or not. And, and even then, if they want to enforce the law, if they don't want to and they want you to they let you off the hook, then you're off the hook. <laughs> you can't get off the hook with God like that. You know, it's like, just say to God, oh, you sure you really want to do that to me? <laughs> you know? That's what we do, the law, you know, it's a police. Isn't it? Oh, I was, I was only five k's over, two k's over. You sure you want to do that? <laughs> laws, and this is one I'd like to labour a bit. Laws operate on the heart, soul, attitude, character, thoughts and emotions of the human and the action taken. Now, you've seen from our previous discussion in permanence how that happens. 
by God creating a whole heap of laws that are actually measuring the energy flow within you in a mathematical calculated way. Right? And that's how it happens. And, and the human thing is, well, they only operate on the action taken. And then only if somebody saw it. And then if they saw it, they could still ignore it. You know, they have to see it and want to do something about it before you were punished or before you were corrected. And it's not the case with God. Correction begins as soon as your heart motivation is out of harmony with love. Bang. Correction begins. And the more your heart motivation is out of harmony with love, the more the correction is enforced. Right? Until such a point as you act, by the time you've acted, you've really completed the thing. But before then, there's plenty of indications you shouldn't be going down that road. Right? And you ignored them. And that's why by the time you're taking the action, there is a serious enforcement then. Right. Yeah. Amber, thanks. If we have the mic down. Where is it at the moment? Oh, he's outside, is he? Yeah. Um, the exciting thing about this is this is where we can really engage to can, become No, God I'm reliant. not doing this with you, Amber. You're making comments. No, not on. And this is, you've been quite unloving in this group already with Mary, and that's not on. Let's move to Anna. Thanks. Um, this reason that... Uh, I'll just hold it a bit closer. Oh, sorry. Um, the reason that God uh, is always um, aware of what we are doing and, yep. and this, is this because we are living inside of God? Of, of course. Any, so you, if you think of God as a... Remember, God's infinite. So, of course, we're living inside of God. Any, any energy that flows inside of God, God is like an extremely sensitive instrument yeah. with any energy flowing inside of God. So therefore, any energy that flows through me, God must feel. Yeah. Simple as that, isn't it? Interesting. Yeah. Good system. Thank you. It means that he can measure everything. Everything, yeah. Okay. Laws operate consistently under all circumstances with no exceptions. All right. Laws operate differently in each country and are inconsistently applied according to hundreds of different variable factors. Like if you're a man, it's different than if you're a woman. If you're rich, it's different than if you're poor. If you're white, it's different than if you're black. If you're, you know, if you're religious, it's different if you're not religious. If you're a certain religion, then it's different if you're not that religion. If, you know, if you're tall or short, then it's different there even. Like even with physical characteristics, it can be different. If you're aged, it's different. If you're above 55, it's different than if you're below 55 if you're above 65 it's different if you're below 65 uh, and it goes on and on and on and on does it not there's no wonder we're so confused god's laws are not like that you can be 80 or two same problem <laughs> right doesn't matter the law is the same now, of course, it also measures intentions and desires. So a two-year-old, obviously, is going to be hard for a two-year-old to have a desire that's out of harmony with love, given the fact they're only two years old. They've probably not developed these desires very much, so, so they're going to get a fairly easy go of it compared to the 80-year-old who's probably now developed hundreds of desires out of harmony with love and, and engaged them. Can, can you see? But the law is consistent e each side. The law is the same. It just operates... The only thing that's variable is the condition of the individual. Right? That's the, variab the variability. Okay, I'm going again to do that. Um, each law has loving penalties if dissipated and loving rewards when obeyed for God's laws. But if we look at human laws, each law only has penalties when disobeyed, usually, and even then only if the disobedience is observed and even then if it is observed only if somebody wants to do something about it and it has to be processed and enforced a certain way right then you have the penalty and this is why you know it's like rapists on the planet right 95 or more percent i think it's something like 98 or 99 percent of rapists get away with it right and certainly child abusers 99 percent of child abusers get away with it sexual abuse or violent abuse, 99% on the planet get away with it. Do you think they get away with it with God? No, from God's perspective, it's one of the most serious things that you can engage. 
has a long-term harmful effect on other people, so therefore it's not something that they are going to get away with with God. Right? And this is the problem is that unfortunately we now believe we're going to get away with it because most of the human law, we could get away with it. And even in our childhood we have this concept sort of thing. Oh, with Daddy, you know, Daddy treated me a bit special, if you're a girl. Daddy treated me a bit special. And if I just sweet talk Daddy a bit, you know, just say some things to him, make him feel good about himself and stuff, or make him feel bad about himself a bit, then, then he'll change his mind. Now, do you think you're going to do that with God? Like, God, you're a rotten scoundrel, and I'm going to, you know, and that's going to change God's mind? Of course not. But, but we believe that it may that we believe that it, we, we believe that it will do because of these predispositions we have with the human law problem. Okay, the penalties and rewards are loving, consistent, and predictable. I love that. You know the permanence principle impli- applied to law. It's fantastic. But what do we find with human laws? The opposite. Many principles are unloving. Re- obedience is rarely rewarded. And the results are usually unpredictable. Like, I can obey a law and still get in trouble on the planet. You know, this is what you found with your parents, didn't you? One day you could do what they asked, and then the next day they wanted you to do something completely different. And you got punished for the thing you did the previous day that they rewarded the previous day. How confusing is that? Not like that with God. We also have each law deals with and addresses both the cause and the effect so so each law is looking at how or why you used your will to disobey or obey the law right and the effect in the fact that we did use our will and there was a whole heap of effects as a result of it right it looks at both of those things human laws of course doesn't do that only deals with disobedience doesn't fully address the effect and only provides penalties to force obedience in the future, but doesn't address the cause or reward the unloving or reward the loving action either. So, man, it's difficult, isn't it, with the human laws in comparison to God's? So Felix, you would like to ask? Um, I, I get a bit about the cause part, but could you give some examples about the effect part? I'm a bit confused about that. Let's say you, Felix, decided to murder somebody. That murder had, had an effect on the person and it took away their life. They now couldn't have a life on earth that continued. It also affected every one of their loved ones in a certain way emotionally, right? Had every one of those effects, you know. So, so, so you know, their mum and dad might, might be grief-stricken for many years as a result because they don't know how to deal with grief. And even if they do know how to deal with grief, they still might be distri- grief-stricken for a while. And, they might, and the, the person you killed might have had children and those children are now without a dad or a mum and, and so forth and so forth. Society now can't benefit from that person being in society. That person obviously had a job that that person can no longer do because you killed them. And, and there's all these flow-on effects from the decision that you made, right? And God measures all of those as well and attributes them to you. Yeah. Yep. So do you mean that that's the um, repentance, uh, that's, that's, a, that's the kind of side where you can really have to rely on God because I could do, I could have fixed that very little. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. I there's a certain things you can do to fix that, but obviously, yeah. obviously you wouldn't be able to if you murder somebody. There's no way you can bring back their life on earth and there's no way you can undo the effects that, that had on the, all the people around them. And so this is where repentance is so important yeah. because yeah. Okay. without God... Uh, helping correct some of these things, they'll never be corrected. And repentance is about the cause and the effect too, right? Of course. Yeah, okay. yeah it's about trying to get rid of the cause. Yeah. In, why did you do it? Uh, you, do you understand why you did it? Yeah. Do you want to change why you did it? Those kind of issues, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, makes sense. Raj, thanks. Up the back thing. Um, thank you. I just wanted to ask, is there a collective community or national penalty aspect to God's laws? Yes. And can you just explain how that might work? Well, it's quite simple. That it, Usually when a, a community decides, let's say Australia decides to go to war, yep. right, as an example, 
that's a community decision. Politicians made it, but in the end, 50% of those people voted for those politicians. The reality is each individual in the country could decide, no, I'm not going to war, couldn't they? Yes. They could. Every person on, in Australia could decide, no, I'm not going to war, I'm not going to respond to <laughs> conscription. And would the government then be able to conscript you? Probably not, right? They wouldn't have the power to do so. But, but most people have to then accede or to agree to an unloving action of a government, right? Now, that is a community responsibility as well as an individual one. So how does the penalty situation, uh, is, how is that incurred? The penalty is incurred by, firstly, the politicians deciding they're going to do something unloving. So each one of those will have a penalty on their soul. There will also be penalty on the soul of every single person who decided they're going to accede to the wish, even whether, whether the, some of them didn't want to but still did it. And the penalty might be different compared to those that did want to and did it. Uh, yeah. But they will all have an individual penalty based upon how they broke all of the laws that were involved at the moment. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Is there then, um, is that where you could have an increase in similar pain and suffering within a, a community or you a will nation? Have. You will have, because every time a community action is taken that's out of harmony with love, most people in the community have degraded their condition. As a result of their degraded condition, there will be additional diseases and hardships that occur because of that degraded condition. And those diseases and hardships are the result of the degraded mm -hmm. condition, which was based upon the decision that was unloving. So, of course, that will happen. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mary, you'd like to ask or say? It's ask? It's an ask. It's sort of spirit. Um, inspired. Yeah. So are you saying that every community that experiences a great deal of pain and suffering is experiencing the pen a penalty based on a breaking of a law? They are. They, and, and it could be that, yes, I am saying that they are. But, but again, you've got to be careful about how far you go here because there's there's often community decisions are based upon passed down ideas or concepts that are out of harmony with love. So they're often passed down through religion or they're often passed down through politics or they're often passed down from parent to child, parent to child, parent to child. And as a result, a community that grows finishes up having much the same attitudes as a result of those particular things. Now, God, God doesn't collectively punish the community each individual, though, will be punished based upon or penalised based upon their individual feelings about that and their individual actions about that. But because most of their individual feelings and individual actions are the same, then, of course, it looks like the community is being punished as a whole. Does that make sense? Uh, because the penalty is the same for each of them if their actions and the cause are the same. And what about communities that seem to be sinning a lot, yes. but also seem to be living in relative comfort? Well, uh, when you say those communities are usually oppressive communities, they oppress other communities. And from God's perspective, while might might be right on earth, it certainly is not in the spirit world. And when I say might, it's not even right on earth from God's perspective either. But but. God, the souls of those, every one of those individuals is being penalised. Yep. So there are some countries, for example, like America at the moment and European countries and Australia, Western countries, where we have spent a lot of time raping and pillaging the other countries of the world. And as a result of that, our soul condition is darker, even though we think it's not. Our soul condition is actually darker than many of those people who pass in the poorer countries. Does that make sense? And so we are being penalised every moment that it happens. But just because we then f feel that we can oppress another country and have relative comfort in this life, it doesn't mean that our soul condition has been, ha is good. Our soul condition remains bad and continually degrades. Yeah. Now, so, so that means actually Western countries on the, on the average are in a much worse soul condition than other countries. And, and therefore... Western countries need to make more changes than other countries as a collective if we're going to come into harmony with love. And also, Western countries are going to find it more difficult because you get more of your addictions met and therefore you're going to have a lot more anger about releasing those addictions than the other countries have. 
So, you know, most Western countries I observe have this superior viewpoint that they are actually better than those other countries that they're raping. And, and as a result, their condition from God's perspective is actually worse. Yep. Make sense? We don't want to get too bogged down in all that because we're still talking about the hangover. And now we're starting to digress into other subjects. Um, can I just uh, mention one or two of these questions? Um, Sherry, where's Sherry? Yep, we've really already answered your question, which was about God's perspective about there being a conflict between human law and God's laws. And as we've seen, if there is a conflict, basically God's laws must be obeyed. If God's laws are not obeyed, there will be penalties from God's perspective. To me, the human penalty for disobeying a human law doesn't really matter so much. What matters is, have I broken God's laws? Right? If I've broken God's laws, then there's long-term soul-based penalties there. If I break a human law and, and it's not breaking God's law, right? Then, then from God's perspective, there is no soul-based penalty. And in fact, if I am then incarcerated for that so-called breaking of a human law, there is a penalty upon the people who incarcerated me. Does that make sense? So, so there is justice in the end, but there's just not much justice when humans decide what to do as a result of their condition. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, I just want to answer another. Answer that one. Yes, Jen H. That's you, isn't it, Jennifer? Um, you've asked, is there anything that can be done to ease the effect of the law? For example, expressing gratitude or being of service. You're trying to manipulate the outcome. And you do this all the time. What you're suggesting is, can I manipulate the outcome by being kind or expressing gratitude or being of service to compensate for what I did? And what I'm suggesting is, is no, you can't. The penalty will be exacted no matter what, what you now wish you could do to undo it. It still will be exacted unless you involve in fully being repented for your action. And I've noticed in your actions with us, you frequently think that expressing gratitude or being of service absolves you from loving action, and it doesn't. Every time you are unloving, there's a penalty on your soul, whether you've expressed gratitude or not. Now... Also, you have to consider, is expressing gratitude or being of service under the condition where you know you broke the law and just feel guilty about it, is the gratitude or the being of service sincere? I would suggest it's not. And this is what I, what I see many of you try to do too. You try an insincere expression of gratitude or being of service in order to compensate for the fact that you've broken laws. Right? God doesn't let you get away with that. Humans might, but God doesn't. All right? and, and it is a major problem that I observe in you, the audience where there's insincere expressions thinking that they compensate for your unloving actions and they don't. The only expressions that do compensate may be sincere expressions, but even then, they are not going to compensate for that particular law that was being broken. There's still that penalty that exists. There will just be a reward for a different law that you've actually upheld. Right? If you are sincerely expressing gratitude or being of service. So I see this problem a lot in the world. Most of us believe that, you know, we can say this nice thing to that person. We can say the nice thing to that person. We can say, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. What can I do about it? In your heart, you're going, no, I'm not really sorry. Right? And you think it's all fine. And it's not. From God's perspective, it's not. Right? And that has to be addressed. Okay. So what are the results of this analysis? Well, it's obvious that we've just got this great big, like, hangover. Right, that we need to start it, it, addressing it. We're drunk on our own perception of law and, uh, and we believe that we are the arbiter and judge. We're allowed to determine what, you know, what we obey and what we don't obey. That's what we think. And we think we're going to get away with that. Right? And we're not. <laughs> we're just not. We see God's laws similarly to how we see human law and they're nowhere near the same. 
They're completely different. We impose our perception of human laws on God's laws. So, so we see this is what I could get away with people, so I should be able to get away with that with God. And it's not going to happen. And we create a huge amount of pain and suffering because of the hangover. We, we don't realise that we're there engaging all of these really bad attitudes that we don't think are bad, but they are bad. And we're engaging these bad attitudes thinking there's not going to be any pain and suffering as a result. And there will be. Because with every single law you break, from God's perspective, there will be pain and suffering as a result in order to correct you. There's going to be some correction at some point. So our attitude to law is compromised. And one of the reasons why we've put this in this session is because if you are really going to understand God's loving laws, you need to see where your attitude to law is compromised. Because if you don't, you're going to merrily go on your way doing the same thing you've always done, hoping for the same results that you've got from humans, as you always have, and you think that you'll be able to get the same results from God, and you won't. And, you're gonna, and this is what I find is many people who have heard divine truth on the earth and many of our friends in the first century were in this boat. They arrived in the spirit world after listening to us for years and years and years teach them about these principles. They arrived in the spirit world in the depths of hell. And you know why? Because they ignored this. They ignored the fact that every time they broke God's law, there was a penalty on their soul. So a lot of the so-called male disciples, they had terrible attitudes towards women back then. Terrible attitudes. They carried those attitudes to their death. So do you think when they passed, they got off the hook just because they did a whole heap of nice things following Jesus and starting up a Christian faith? Of course they didn't. They went to hell like everybody else who was in that condition went. The same place, in fact. Right? Until they realised, huh? this is what it was all about. Jesus told me about this. That's why Jesus had Mary Magdalene on his arm all the time. And that's why he let her come along to our meetings, our men's meetings, you know, our men's groups. And he didn't preclude her from anything else because he was trying to teach us that our attitudes here were way up the creek, right? If they had, if they had noticed what we were doing, they wouldn't have arrived in the place that they arrived in. But what I see happens with many of our interactions with you is that you notice what we do and you think that it's some whimsy or fancy that causes us to do what we do. And that you should be able to have your whimsy and fancy like we do. That's what you think. And so you, you, you think that you're going to get away with a whole heap of things that I know you're not going to get away with. Right? Something's going to happen down the track. And it might not happen on earth, although you will experience some pain and suffering as a result, but it will definitely ha happen as soon as you pass. Definitely. Make sense? So stop believing that everything's great and you'll be fine and start seeing that, no, everything is great because God makes everything consistent and you're not absolved, you're not excluded from this consistency. God will impose everything that God has always imposed on everybody on you too. It's going to be exact. It's going to be to the finest detail and it's going to be there for you to see uh, in the end. So that's what I'd like to leave with you. We can, now, we can then progress over the next few days, obviously, to, to examine these laws. So we want to see that the laws are different and everything, and we want to examine them. So what we're going to do is look at our attitudes. We're going to compare God's attitudes with your attitudes with regard to law. And then what we're going to do is go back over this material and ask you the question, what's your hangover? And we have a bit of a discussion about what you've noticed you doing. Because this is a lot about needing self-awareness. You need more self-awareness here in this aspect. We need to see how our attitudes are playing out and how it's causing our own grief. Does that make sense? So we'll be doing that in a couple of days' time. So I'd like to thank you for your time just now and we'll... Uh, thank you. If we can come back at 5 to 2... Um, is that okay? We're five minutes late today, so five to two.
Um, and we'll talk to you about the next principle, which is scope principles.